Kremlin is a funny game. Um, kind of reminds me of Junta in terms of kind of the, the mood that our group used to be in when we'd want to play that. The wanting to do a kind of light game, uh, but with political overtones or whatever. Not really a simulation, more of a gamey type game. It certainly got a different kind of design, though. It's less war. I mean, Junta presents you with a war game every every few turns, basically a very simple one, but a war game all the same. Whereas uh, this is just purely this kind of power manipulation on the board. Yay, the board. Um, let's close this up. You've gotten a chance to see it through all the playthroughs. In some ways, it almost feels like a party game to me, in terms of the, you know, a bunch of people bidding on something secretly at the beginning. But there's obviously way more uh, detail to the game and playing out the different thing, the different aspects, than any party game would have. It just, it has sort of that flavor, and there's a certain silliness to it all. Maybe not so much with these, but with the rest of it. These cards you'd think are kind of the, uh, where a lot of silliness would end up showing up. Well, the character cards are very silly, and that's probably why it comes up. I mean, they're, they're parodies of real characters or imaginary ones like Boris and Natasha. Uh, but the actual uh, event cards are very historically based. So, my guess is the original Swiss version was much more of a, a lighter type of idea of a game and that uh, the Avalon Hill version tried to appeal more to the wargamer or current events type player. The cards do add something to the game. I didn't play with them. Um, you don't have this huge influx of them. They add an interesting choice where if you don't want to put in the advanced game, if you don't want to put additional influence on your sheet, on your on pieces, where it's exposed directly on the board, you don't want to signal anything with that. You don't have any great game tip from that. You might want to draw a card instead. Um, they give you certain little advantages that usually don't last too long. Uh, for example, here, flu epidemic, it's going to cause all health uh, rolls to be modified with a penalty. So it makes everybody who's in the Politburo easier to kill. Uh, requirements of who has to be purged first. And that purge actually happens uh, semi-automatically. Yeah. These are all, you know, interesting ways to kind of unbalance that very simple mechanism of the game, of the game itself, which is this, I've got a secret bid on someone, and once I've, once somebody, maybe me, uh, but with my acquiescence at least, has maneuvered them into a higher political position, I might be interested in revealing the extent of my bid so that I can use their powers. And the further up you go in, in, in you know, the further up that somebody's kind of unrevealed, but a couple of people have points on them, the more likely they're going to bubble up to the top and then come down to the showdown. Okay, how many points do you have on him? Uh, if somebody else is promoting someone and you have low points on them, chances are you ain't got them. But you can't tell. Sometimes, especially late in the game, people with very low points are exactly what's left under in somebody's holding of their truck card. So it is this game of, uh, you know, suspense as to whether or not the guy you're promoting right now, that you're really going to get him. There is kind of a, a little bit of a, a, an annoyance that may be there for a lot of people, which is, it's the first person who throws his bid down on it who has the advantage with that bid. And in particular, if you're putting above a 10 bid, it's the first person who throws the 11 down or whatever, who now has taken complete control of that character. That leads this kind of 
a weird amount of sitting on the edge of your seat, thinking, thinking, thinking. Ah! <laughs> you know, you see somebody moving towards it or whatever. You want to make sure you slap your big bid down at that point. But you slap too big a bid down, and you've revealed more. So there, there's that the tension's still there. It's just at some point or another, somebody reaches high enough that you do want to put your big bid down and hope to let it ride as a bet or whatever. There isn't really a whole hell of a lot else in the game. I mean, uh, aging, the uh, KGB purges, these things are done by die roll. That adds a little bit of excitement in, in it in the sense that uh, if it were just this pure bidding and voting mechanism in place, with nothing to shake it up, and none of these cards, the cards also add some to shake it up, I think it would lose any interest very, very quickly. But that kind of pure mechanism works well as the underlying position to this, to adding a little bit of randomness to it, with the health rolls, uh, with the purges. The defense minister has a completely different kind of power, which is putting investigations on people and then being able to bring them to trial in which the players, in almost uh, a predetermined way, based on the, vo the bids that are on those characters, the players control through their voting whether or not somebody gets condemned there. Condemning someone you have points on sometimes is worthwhile. That's kind of interesting. Not points that are revealed uh, so much as points that aren't revealed, because you can clear away the revealed points by sending someone off to Siberia for a little re-education and bring them back, and now they're, they're you know, following your doctrine. Uh, anytime you bring someone, promote someone, whatever, you're tagging them. Uh, you're noting, I've got an interest in this person. So there's a possibility of deception there in the sense that you could bring someone up that you don't have points on and maybe make him a target and maybe that'll hurt other people at the very least it'll use up uh, bullets that the KGB or the uh, uh, defense minister has available to them. You didn't see any of that in my solo playthrough and that's really that's the other thing about it is the solo playthrough just does not do it any justice. It's like, like I said, there's an aspect of kind of party game here. A mellower party game, not like charades where you're dancing around or anything. But that core mechanism is something so simple, this hidden bid and trying to maneuver people into position, that it almost feels apt. And, Party games are just notoriously horrible things to try to play solitaire. Trivia games, stuff like that, you just can't do it. Well, in the same way, this hidden information and it being so central to the game makes it very, very difficult. You, you could kind of say the same, in fact I do, uh, about diplomacy. It's not the same game solitaire. I can enjoy this solitaire, I can enjoy diplomacy solitaire. The problem with this solitaire is what I ended up generating and then all the cross-referencing to see if anybody's going to act or anything. This is just a nightmarish chore uh, on video and maybe I'm not into that anymore in any sense of the, the word. At one point in my life uh, I was more interested in playing Kremlin for Kremlin's sake that I was willing to play it solo just to get that storyline out of it, to watch what's happening. Not very often. Uh, it was not one of my favorite solo games. But, you know, it didn't bother me maybe any more than, say, Republic of Rome did. Now, I still can play Republic of Rome because uh, the burden's a little less on, on getting a good solitaire game. But I can't do it with Kremlin. But yeah, overall, Kremlin was kind of a fun filler type game. It's long for, by today's standards, probably. Uh, it takes a couple hours. I don't know, maybe three hours. Um, which is pretty hefty, but in our view, generally, we'd play a decent size game, like an 18xx or something, and this felt light 
in comparison. You know, this was something you could just kind of sit down and do for shits and giggles. Uh, we tended to know the rules pretty well. Uh, and, and it just didn't fade very easily. I'm not talking about a lot of plays, maybe a couple times a year. It, it wasn't the kind of thing like bridge or something that we'd do as a filler. But, uh, you know, it helped fill out the gaming night when you weren't really ready for another... Uh, another big game, even if you already knew the rules, when you really wanted something uh, kind of mellow, where you didn't have to think too hard. It's not that there aren't these hard decisions, it's just there's not much you can do to calculate them. You, you either put your bid down or you don't when, when you have it hidden there. You, you either make the decision to reveal or not. So, in that light, it's a fun game. It's not the kind of game that your Euro Optimizer gamer is going to love. Uh, but it's also a very peculiar game for its era. Uh, this kind of clear design, at least of the underlying game of the bids uh, and the revelation, didn't exist very often. You, you know, it came originally out of Switzerland. It may have been heavily influenced by the earliest of the, the early uh, German games uh, before they really became popular in the US. And this may actually be one of the early examples of the translations of a European German style clean design game. Of course, it being in Greenwood's hands, not only did he make the rules uh, more difficult to access, perhaps, but he also added these uh, event cards, and then also there was the push to add historical variants. So you have the revolutionary variant, and then you have, uh, there was one that came out of the general to further expand that into uh, Stalin's reign. Those almost I, one reason I never went for the revolutionary variant, never went out and tried to get it, and now it's kind of expensive, is that uh, the spirit of this game, because of the characters, is almost silliness. And the whole, what's my goal? My goal is to wave. That does not feel like the Lenin-Trotsky-Stalin conflict, right? I mean, no conflict with Lenin there, but the Trotsky-Stalin conflict after Lenin's death. The game's mechanisms may represent it perfectly fine, but the silly aspect of the game completely kept me from wanting to play it that way. Anyway, uh, it looks like there's going to be a reprint of Kremlin. I see one scheduled for 2014. I don't know how well it'll do in today's market. It's going to get the nostalgia gamer, perhaps, who remembers having fun with it. But... It doesn't fit the same mold as most Euros do. And Euro gamers, like war gamers maybe, like a lot of gamers, kind of go down a certain channel. So if you look at something uh, that I'd say, obviously, I mean, it's from Splatterspiel, uh, is a clear Euro, uh, this VOC, well, I don't think this is terribly popular because the mechanisms don't fit what the modern, heavier, optimization-style Euro player really wants to see. It involves drawing on a board and stuff like that with your eyes closed. That's just weird shit, right? Well, in some ways, this is kind of weird, too. And it's got pieces like the high randomness on the, on the death rolls, etc., which... Um can really destabilize the situation. Now, I like that. I like a lot of randomness in my games, but you get the feeling that the average Euro uh, player wants something where it's really my decisions controlling it all. There's also a lot of conflict in this, in the sense of, uh, you know, the actions that you're taking between, first of all, the bidding is directly in, in opposition to one another. So, you know, you're going to trump somebody and they're going to take something away from you and you're going to say, ah, you're just always outbidding me, you know. I, I chose one guy to put my 10 on 
and then everybody else I'm putting one less than your choice. That sucks, you know? I, I'm just dominated by you in every single character except the one that I had my top bid on. Uh, something like that could happen where it's basically random chance even though the players are making the selections uh, because it's hidden at the beginning of the game. And then there's also just the high uh, luck factor in the die rolls uh, for the for the uh, purchase and for the aging especially. Uh, and then of course the cards also add a, a significant random factor if you play with them. So I don't know how much it's going to appeal to the modern Euro gamer, and on the other hand, the modern AT style gamer, well, this isn't filled with lots of plastic pieces and all that epic stuff that they love. Uh, so, I think it may kind of flop. It's gotten, it's got its fans, and it's probably got a bunch of people who want it back. But I think other than the Nostalgia Gamer, I don't know how much of a place there really is in the market for it anymore. I think it's a cool game still. If I had a gaming group, this would be something that, again, I would want to use as that filler. Hey, we got three hours left. You know, we got time for a decent sized game, but we don't have the brain for it right now, right? All right. Uh, because.